Okay, so hey everyone, welcome to the Trailblazers podcast for another episode. We've got a great guest today that we think you guys will learn a lot from. So Dave, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about who we'll be hearing from today. Yeah, thanks Tyler. Today on the podcast, we have Malcolm Kennedy, who's currently a data scientist at Whale Seeker, I believe based out of Montreal. And Malcolm talks to us a little bit about his journey of when he started as a bachelor's student at the University of Cambridge. And then um, after his time had kind of finished up in the UK, coming back and uh, doing his master's at McGill in uh, Canada. And he talks to us a little bit about his experience as like an expat in um, the United Kingdom, his experience as a student there as well, his time as a master's student and how he was researching about whale songs. Um, and then I believe he talks about his um, experience in learning coding too, because he was trying to basically like get um, some automation through with his master's research. And then he had learned Python to basically do some of his master's research. And when he graduated, he started as a teacher at a school. And then I think his friend told him that this crazy startup called Whale, or not crazy startup, sorry, the startup called uh, Whale Seeker in Montreal uh, had this like crazy coincidence that basically they were also researching about like whale songs and how to like automate those processes. And then there was kind of this perfect match made between uh, Malcolm and this particular opportunity with Whale Seekers. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy the episode. Um, there's a lot of wisdom and content in there. And uh, Tyler, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I thought it was a great interview. Um, anybody that's curious about maybe learning a little bit of coding that doesn't have a, a software background, he speaks a little bit about, you know, how you can kind of take on a project in order to do something with that code makes it a little bit easier to learn. So I appreciated that tidbit that he gave. Um, and also just the, you know, kind of the thread of how he followed through his career. Because if you just look at his LinkedIn profile, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like he's kind of all over the place, but I really liked his explanation for, um, how these, the, all these activities kind of have like a bit of a common thread running through them. So it was good to get his, uh, thoughts on that. And yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting how he got that job opportunity. And I think, uh, it shows that if you really pursue your interests, people around you in your network, are going to know what you're interested in and kind of when opportunities come up like that, they're going to get funneled towards you. Like he got this recommendation from a friend or something like that. So it just goes all the more to show if you're interested in something kind of get involved with it, let people that you know about it, stuff like that, and more and more opportunities in that space will find you. But uh, yeah, I think you guys are really going to enjoy this interview with Malcolm. So without further ado, uh, we'll slide it over to the interview. And right before we get there, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, everything. And uh, yeah, have a good one. So Malcolm, why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe say like your educational journey to this point in time, and maybe as well, like what you're doing uh, for work now at Whale Seeker. Yeah, sounds good. So uh my educational journey i guess started in high school i was really interested in languages which is a good segue but um uh mm -hmm. i was really I, I was taking french and russian and latin and i just really like liked comparing them and liked like um i mean i i liked i like speaking them but i also like like looking at them kind of like under a microscope so to speak like kind of being like oh mm -hmm. how did french like i was taking latin and french and i was like well, how did that turn into that? You know, how did, um, and so I applied to linguistics, um, at Cambridge, uh, which was, which was sort of a crazy, I mean, I was applying to Canadian universities, um, mostly mm -hmm. like McGill was my, 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 uh, kind of top choice in Canada. They have a good, I was actually going to do biology and linguistics, which it turns out is what I ended up doing anyways, but I was going to do that at, at McGill for my undergrad. Uh, mm -hmm. But I got into linguistics at Cambridge in England. So um, and like, there was this there's a scholarship. So anyways, I, I ended up uh, taking that kind of on a, you know, like I applied kind of not really thinking I would get in or go. But like I once I got in, I was kind of like, all right, I, I guess this, this seems like kind of like I would regret not doing it. So might as well go for it. Um, so I don't know if you were under this in depth of an answer to start with, or, or if you, please, but oh, no, continue. that's, no, that's perfect. Go for it, man. So we want to hear all of it. So, yeah. So then I did three years at Cambridge. They do these kind of like, um, concentrated undergrads, like, um, like undergrad concentrate where you do three years and you don't do any yeah. minors and you don't do any electives. So that was my undergrad, just linguistics, which is like a really strange undergrad to have. Cause it's like so specific and like stuff that most people would learn in grad school. Um, and then I kind of, yeah, I wanted to do a PhD in linguistics at one point. And then I kind of was like, 
uh, kind of sick of it by the end or like kind of feeling like it was like a very like insular field and like didn't have a lot of applications that I was interested in. Um, so I applied. Oh, yeah. And, and then, then during my undergrad, I got into Wales, which was uh, so I did my honors thesis on humpback whale song and comparing it to human language. And then that led me to applying to a master's in biology, which I initially wanted to do a master's on humpback whale song. Couldn't get funding to do that. So I, I settled for a, a bird song master's at McGill, which was great because I could come back to Canada, which I was kind of down for at that point. And so I came back to Canada, did that at McGill. And then, yeah, but I, I mean, I always like whales were my thing. So um, I kind of had that in the back of my mind, like, oh, I'd love to get, get back to Wales in some way um, at some point in time. And I finished the bird masters. And then lo and behold, like a, a couple of months later, I found this job, like at a, or I, I found this startup, not the job yet, but a, a startup based in Montreal that does whale detection They're called Whale Seeker. And mm -hmm. at the time they were three people now they are six or we are six and um they do yeah whale detection from aerial imagery and it's awesome yeah it's just like exactly like it's like coding which is what i was kind of into in my masters anyways and it's like exactly um exactly my thing and it's just kind of yeah really lucky <laughs> that i found it but yeah that's that's super interesting yeah, and I would kind of ask, uh, so you're there doing that now, and it seems like you've just been kind of all over the map. And so I'm just like wondering if we look for a pattern between like, you know, linguistics and whales and you're doing coding now, what, is, what do you feel like is the thing that kind of ties it all together for you? What's like mm. the string that runs through all of those experiences that kind of makes them kind of all make sense together? Because I feel like there's something there, but I'm just not quite understanding it, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see the the common thread between my undergrad and my master's, and then between my master's and my job. But I don't know about all the way through. So, like, my <laughs> undergrad was in linguistics, and it's like kind of I was trying in my master's to kind of do some. Comp I don't know, not exactly, but like try like to, to like apply linguistic methods to bird song. So it was like looking at mm -hmm. like I don't know, do these models for like computational models of language where you can try to like um, the people use in like NLP where you, you'd like try to predict what's coming next next in a sentence based on what's come before. I was trying to do something similar with with birdsong. Um, so there was a there was a common thread, although it was it was wild. It was like very much a new experience and something I wasn't fully equipped for, like going into that master's in biology and um, so I don't know if there was as much of a common thread as I thought there would be going into it. And then, yeah, between my master's and now, I mean, I started learning, I started learning to code, like I started learning Python in my master's, which wasn't like mm -hmm. uh, required for my master's, but I just like, it was like, I was doing all this manual grunt work, um, which like, so like in a birdsong lab, if you walk into a birdsong lab, which there are actually quite a few of like, you know, like a hundred in the world, you walk into any given one there will be birds in boxes and then there will be grad students labeling bird song on like labeling spectrograms on a computer so like typing mm -hmm. random letters into the computer to say this is this level we've called a j and this one we've called an a and then just just like typing and it's so much work like it's and so i was kind of like oh like oh yeah we could aut automate that that would be sweet and i kind of tried dabbled in that and i did some other coding and I mean, now what I'm doing is is automating a manual process in my current job, which is manu this manual annotation of whales from aerial imagery. So that's, I think, a parallel where, like, it's really appealing to me to just be like, oh, like, this is like labor that is important, but like kind of boring. Um, can, is there a way we can automate this? Like, this needs to get done, but yeah, if we could, if we can automate that. Um, so that's, I think, maybe the common thread. And, and I also learned to use Python. Yeah. 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 I feel like it's like really kind of an interesting sort of take on a lot of things because it sounds like, you know, you had this sort of like really strong interest in 
whales and like linguistics behind them during your bachelor's um, and writing your thesis. And then, you know, had this period of your master's where you maybe went and learned some kind of, you know, more adjacent skills that are in a couple of different areas. And then finally, it's like, it seems like your job right now, you're sort of like wrapping all this kind of like compounded time, um, you know, looking at birds, looking at linguistics, looking at coding and like getting back to kind of the whales. So actually, I'm sort of mm -hmm. curious, do you mind like talking to me a little bit about the job search process for you, like, and how that worked? Um, and then, you know, how, how did that happen too? like when you found obviously found this company you're really keen on and really interested on? Um, and like, how did you sort of go in your outreach to them? Yeah, I was, I honestly, I just got really lucky. Like I, I'm, I mean, like me and me and my girlfriend, when we lived in Montreal, we used to joke about like there being a whale startup in Montreal that was just waiting to hire me. It was kind of like a, like, oh, as if, you know, like someone's going to hire me to write code and it's going to have to do with whales and it's going to be in Canada. Like it was like kind of an, an inside joke. And then I like, yeah, like r right after I was graduating um, from my master's, a friend just sent me like they I mean people send me like whale stuff just because like if you're into x people send you like you know oh I saw this it's related to x um so I so mm -hmm. someone sent me it's kind of like an internship posting in, internal to McGill where they were like whale seeker who's my um my current employer um was posting for this like undergrad uh intern like I think a summer intern and I wasn't eligible I was like a grad student and I just graduated from McGill anyways, but I was like, dude, like, and I looked at their website, I was like, what? Like, this is like <laughs> um, insane. Like this is in Canada. It's like, it seemed like they're, you know, um, yeah, it's, it seems like a really cool company. It has to do with whales. Um, and so I emailed the CEO um, who was at the time, one, yeah, one of the, so one of the three founders and she emailed me back and, you know, um, they didn't have, necessarily like the funding at that at that point and I ended up taking another job uh for the next year so I I thought it was kind of a, like a half-time job or slightly more and I, mm -hmm. so I took, took that it was a teaching job at, at a private school in Toronto mm -hmm. so I was signed up for that for September and then I kind of sat around in the summer thinking oh you know if only I could could have done that whale thing um and then right as i was starting my teaching job like in october i was like you know in the kind of utter chaos of like being a teacher for the first time um uh they the ceo of whale seeker emily she emailed me and was like uh actually we have you know like some some uh opportunities available like and i was like oh you know fudge um uh but like you know bad timing but but also like um really excited um and so i ended up doing both I ended up doing kind of like splitting my time and doing that in addition because i couldn't like pass it up but i also couldn't do it full time so i did i was like okay i'll do half that half time and do the teaching half time mm -hmm. and then uh yeah one thing led to another and the, uh, another and they kind of yeah they ended up um keeping me on full time after that so that was um yeah yeah really awesome the timing wasn't perfect but you know like um but i think i didn't really have a job hunt right like i was just like this thing came to me serendipitously mm -hmm. and then i was like pursuing it I, you yeah yeah exactly the whales the whales sought me yeah <laughs> yeah um I think it's uh, really ironic that, you know, you were talking about this with your girlfriend beforehand. What if there was a whale startup in Montreal? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, and it's really clear that you're really passionate about your job. You really love what you're doing. You wanted this opportunity. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of students perhaps like don't have that, that are in university right now. They're just like, they wouldn't know, you know, what the perfect job would be if it uh, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, until they stumble across it. So I was just kind of wondering, you know, you found kind of like a why that is, it seems like working with whales and linguistics. Uh, how did you kind of come across this? Is there like some, some, some method or something you can look back and say, like, you were a bit more curious, exploratory, and then you stumbled across this? Or how did that kind of come about? And how would you recommend people can find something they're as passionate about as you are about whales and linguistics? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, uh, I guess the, yeah, the whales thing, like 
it is like I love I love whales, but I I also feel like you don't need to have like one thing that like more and more I'm feeling like um like the, the, your dream job is not necessarily going to be like to do with the one thing that you think is your passion and is like like I. Um, so like, like for me, it happened, that, it happened that way. And I'm like super grateful, but there's also lots of other things I could be interested in. So I think like whales were just kind of like this thing that kind of like a nucleus. It's, it's, I got it. I read this paper in university, um, and it started, and I guess everyone has that, those, right. Like in their, in their life, like, you know, things that are just like, Oh, like that pops out to me. And then you, you learn a bit more about it and, um, that kind of starts to snowball, um, so that like in terms of subject matter, I don't know, but I guess in terms of like, um, there's, so there's like the subject matter and then there's like the methods, like, which is like coding in this case, like, or like data science slash, um, yeah, I guess data science is, is what I do. And, and that I think, mm -hmm. um, maybe is like a little easier to cultivate or like to be, to be a little more intentional about like, um, and I'm not, I don't know. So, so your question is like, how, how can, how can people kind of find that? Find exactly. what if they don't have a thing. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, I guess um, for me, like it was like what I was talking about with that, just being like, it started with like this problem, which was like, I was at this bird, bird lab. I didn't know how to code. I was there as a grad student and there was like a lot of manual labor or like not manual, but like, you know, digital labor um, involved in just mm -hmm. like getting um, data. And so that was kind of like, it was like an annoyance that it started with and then being like, okay, how, like I didn't, I wasn't interested in coding necessarily. I was like, I was like, ah, like coding, you know, that's for smart people. But I was like also really needed to speed things up because like I couldn't get the kinds of, numbers I wanted out of the data and if I didn't know how to code. So I got mm -hmm. my sister to teach me the basics of Python, um, who, yeah, my sister is who's, who's a, a programmer. And then I kind of took it from there. And, and then, you know, once it, once I, um, yeah, like once I figured out, I guess that like coding could solve these problems that I like was interested in, I was like, oh, coding's awesome. Like, you know, um, but it was definitely weird because like, I didn't think coding, like going, coming out of undergrad, there, there was no way I thought like coding was going to be my career. Like I, I, I uh, mm -hmm. hadn't written, like I'd written like maybe two lines of code <laughs> in my life. And, um, so yeah, I guess just like, maybe, I don't know if there's like a systematic approach that you could extract from that, but for me, it was like, you know, like figuring out like, what's, what's something that like, you know, I like data. I like good data. Like I like, um, numbers that are interesting and tell, like, you know, um, tell stories about the natural world. Um, and of course, like there's an obstacle there, right? Like if you, you can't sift through, you can't like, you know, you can only sift through so much data by hand. And so like finding, yeah, finding something that kind of can surmount some obstacle that you're, I don't know. I don't know if that's really like, but, I, but again, like, I, yeah, I don't know if yeah. I have a good answer in terms of like, what, here are the steps, like, cause it's just, that's the way it happened to me. And, but, um, yeah. I think most people would say it's not really like formulaic, but, uh, you know, I think the way you've described it there kind of gives a good approach and that you found a problem, something you're curious in, and you just kind of followed that path. And I think that's a totally great way to, uh, to approach that. Yeah. Like the one I actually, so I, I, I just pulled like my notebook and I wrote like a quote you basically mentioned in there that I found interesting. Kat, Tyler, you're basically pointing on it too. Everyone has these things in their lives that like once they're interested in, uh, they kind of go into it and then it just starts snowballing, right? Like that's like the one quote that I sort of found like really interesting from that. And I think in mm -hmm. your case too, you kind of showcase is that like it happened for you and because you went and it started snowballing, you know, this opportunity sort of just like fell into your lap. And I think that's like good advice to kind of maybe say like say that you know young professionals or students who are sort of trying to find those right careers for them is it may yeah. not have to be like the perfect fit for you but it needs to be like a good enough overlap with like things that you're interested in and then as long as it feels like it's in your snowballing plan just like go with it um, 
Um, that's yeah. kind of how I'm feeling about that, like based on your advice. For sure, for sure. And it's not like entirely coincidence that this job found its way to me, right? Because I was like, you know, researching whales after after school or like thinking about them and talking about them to people. And and that's why the, the job came to me because I talked to this friend about whales. So it's, yeah, it is like, yeah, maybe being kind of aware of, yeah, I mean, you, you can't, you can't force, force it, of course, but like, you know, yeah, following those things that, yeah, that kind of pull you, pull you forward. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. One question that I have now is because like you have touched on a lot of different like broad topics so far in your educational journey and in your career. Do you mind kind of talking to us a little bit like based on how you sort of see your work now and your experiences at this point, do you feel like knowledge is kind of more valuable for you if you go really deep in one area or have you found knowledge to be like more valuable for you if you like continue to go kind of wider, but maybe not mm -hmm. as deep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, I had a weird... My undergrad, as I mentioned, was like this weird undergrad where it was like, uh, you're going to study this for three years and nothing else, right? Like literally nothing, no electives. Um, so I, I think I got, I think it's satisfying, you know, like um, it's that, that I, I found that a satisfying experience. Um, but I also... I also was a little envious sometimes of like North American or even Scottish in, in the UK uh, undergrads where, um, where you just get to kind of like, I guess um, if you guys did engineering, it may not be the, the exact same, but like in the, the arts or science undergrad, you just get to kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this course. And then you kind of like, you know, that those things kind of assemble together into a degree as opposed to like, this mm -hmm. is my degree and I will follow it, you know, until it's over. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was cool. Cause you, the, the kind of advantage of going deep in that context is you, um, you just get to like, I don't know, by, by the end of my undergrad, I was like, re just like doing original research, um, in a way that felt like I could actually do it as opposed to like, um, it, um, yeah, like I just, it, it felt like, I was, I was there. And, um, so yeah, so it's definitely, um, but then I guess, uh, in my master's, I went and I did that and did went broad, so to speak, mm -hmm. cause I did something completely different and I don't know, it's, it, it's, it's fun to, it's, it's definitely like, I think I, I think my interests outside of school are definitely drawn to like lots of different stuff. Um, but, um, but there is a satisfaction, right? Like, I don't know. And, and, and that snowballing that we were talking about, right? Like that is kind of a symptom of going deep in something, right? Like if you, if you're following one thing, then that's going to be your thing and people are going to like bring you stuff on that thing. And like, um, yeah, so maybe that's kind of another answer. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it creates a bit of a feedback loop in that case and that, you know, you're interested in something and then the world just kind of keeps on giving you more of that and more of that and you, yeah. you follow it more and more if, uh, if you like it. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. kind of want to change gears a little bit in that, you know, it seems like you've gone broad in your range of, uh, education and the things you've done. Uh, but you've also gone literally abroad to, uh, the UK for your, your masters. Right. And so there's not a lot of people, well, there are quite a few, but a lot of people don't get that experience of going abroad and being an expat. Like Dave and I have worked in other countries, um, and, and things like that. And so I'm just kind of wondering if you can speak to that experience, if you would recommend people that have never been abroad before for school or work, that they should pursue something like that. How was the experience for you? Kind of, what did you take away from it? And, and kind of, you know, what doors did that open, you know, in terms of opportunity or just mentally, how did you change as a person because of that whole experience? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. If I like for me, I think, well, I guess, it, yeah, I guess for me, I, I felt like my, like studying in the UK, like I don't regret it, but I don't think it was like, like a life changing or like necessarily positive, like thing in my life. Like I, like, I think that mm -hmm. I had great, I had great profs. I had, um, some really great opportunities during my undergrad, but I think I would have in Canada as well. So like the education, you know, that's, um, the quality of your education, that's one thing, but like, 
in terms of being abroad, I think the one thing, um, the one thing I, I did appreciate about, about being abroad, um, was like, so I, I think Cambridge, Cambridge was like something like 80 or 85% British and then like 15 or 20% mm -hmm. international, but it definitely felt like a lot more than that to me, because when you're a, an expat, you're like drawn, there's like this like magnetic force that brings you to other internationals, like, like you have something in common yeah. with them, which is kind of cool, right? Because like, normally, if I was in Canada, I wouldn't think I have something in common with like, people from Vietnam and people from like, you know, uh, Lithuania or whatever, you know, like, but those were the people mm -hmm. I was drawn to, like in my, the people who I was closest, like my closest friend group at college was like, yeah, Lithuanian, Vietnamese guy, one token Brit and a Texan. It was like, we were together because, you know, um, we were outsiders. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's kind of cool. But um, then of course the caveat is you, at the end of your degree, if you do, if you do a degree abroad, um, the odds are pretty slim. You'll ever see any of those people like, or like a few, you know, like you'll see them a few times before you die. Right. Which is like a little, like <laughs> I found that like graduating, I found that a little bit like a bubble, like, whoa, like, you know, that's like, it's kind of cool to be in England, but also like um, to not like see your friends basically ever. It's kind of a hard hit, you know, like, so I don't know if I would like recommend it, but, um, for, or like do it again necessarily for me personally. I love, I love Cambridge. It was, I had, I had some great props, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know what you're saying. Like, yeah, I can, I can sympathize with that for as high as the highs are. There's just as many lows. Like it's kind of an intense emotional roller coaster. So if you don't have that emotional resilience, be prepared to build it. If you go abroad, cause there's going to be a lot of things to miss back home. You kind of know your For time sure. is finite when you're away. And so the people you meet might not always be there. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know, in some ways, I felt like for me, that made the moments a lot more richer that I got to spend with them, even though it was, you know, a bit more, you know, sad that I wouldn't see them again, probably for a while. Um, but yeah, so it is, I would just say, like, there's a lot of the same feelings, but then the magnitudes at which you experience them are, are higher. And I think, Dave, you can probably speak to kind of the, the same thing in some sense. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I think like, this is one thing I'm already starting to realize now is that like, cause I think I would have left China like a little bit more than two years ago right now. And then like, I've been able to see some of my friends a couple times since like, obviously the pandemic doesn't help anything. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. um, but you know, I, I, I agree with both of you guys. I think it's just like at this point, then you cherish those memories more. And then like the chimes that you have to reconnect with those people that you made those like great connections with, like whether it's just like a virtual connection, like a phone call or whether it's like an in-person, like you just like make the most of like those periods of time that you're together, right? Like you don't have to like think to that extent. And it's actually kind of an interesting phenomenon too, because now like Malcolm, you're pointing this out to me is that like, you really will build the best relationships with the people in the place that you're with at like that period of time. Right. Like, and usually like these relationships are not like super easy to build organically, like the older you get and like the more busy your lives become. So it's like, you know, just trying to like make sure that like in those periods of time, we put like the most emphasis into like making the most um, out of those opportunities. Um, okay. And then with, you know, everybody giving you a little bit of chicken soup, I'll bring it back and, uh, you know, continue along. <laughs> Actually, I'm kind of curious, Malcolm, do you mind walking me through, like, I think where I kind of want to point this question is something like this is like, I know self-teaching yourself, like coding or like a technical skill is not like an easy thing to do. So do you mind like walking us through like a little bit about your journey and say like developing like a difficult technical skill like that? And like maybe any mm -hmm. adversity that you had to overcome during that journey? Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, yeah, like I said, I started, my sister taught me like a few lines of Python and then I kind of felt like when you knew a few lines, at least with Python, like it's kind of like, you can just Google stuff, right? Like you can just start, yeah. um, it, like if you've got a clearly defined task, I think that was the, the kind of the secret for me was like, I had, I was doing this master's project. I had like, stuff I knew, like I like clearly like well-defined things I wanted to find out. I knew the procedures in my head, how I would do it by hand. Um, and so I had like an endless supply of like stuff, uh, like, you know, um, you know, code to write, 
um, and I just had to figure out how to write it. Um, and I kind of I felt like that was like quite a, a good way to learn, at least if in terms of like self teaching, because um, I think I think it can be hard for some people to like okay, like I've learned a few lines of Python, I've like written, um, you know, like this assignment for my intro class or whatever, but like, what do I, what do I write next? Like it kind of, it can seem like a chore if you, maybe if you're not like mm -hmm. coding something that you want to use, which, which, so I think, I think that maybe, maybe is the key, like being like, okay, what can I code that I would care about? Like, you know, like the, um, either because of, I'm studying it or if you want to make like an app or if you want to make like something that you think like doesn't exist, right? Like, as opposed to like, like imitating existing things and going through that. I think for me, like that was, that was the key. And then I, at the end of my master's, I was st still very much like self-taught. Like I was not a good, like, so I think that's good. Like, but you don't get like, you don't, you don't have much like rigor. Like you learn how to code anything, but not how to code anything well. Um, so Mm -hmm. then there's that extra step of like, how do you learn how to code well? And I think that I, I was just very lucky um, to be taken on by whale seeker and, and my, um, my, uh, my CTO is just really like, he, he's been, he's been around the block with um, tech and Python and other, other languages. And he was just really like took me under his wing and showed me how to write tests mm -hmm. and all these things and, and, and make my code, you know, readable. And, um, so that's, yeah, that I think would be harder to learn fully self-taught. Um, but I'm sure there, I'm sure there's a way I wouldn't be the person to, to, to tell you though, but I, you can def definitely get a long way, right. If you got your own project and you just Google stuff and you just like, okay, how do I do this? You know, like copy that snippet and then eventually you memorize that snippet and then, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no. And you know, it's interesting that, you know, you self-taught yourself, uh, enough to the point where it seems like you can actually, you can explain this qu quite well and almost teach it in a sense, because I found an article that you wrote on Whale, Se uh, Whale Seeker talking about uh, how precise does machine learning and your algorithms actually need to be, uh, you know, because you're saying that humans disagree on average, like 10% of the time. And so it's okay if the algorithm uh, can get to that level, where is the threshold of truth kind of. And so that it may be because I don't have a background in software, machine learning or anything like that. And the whole article made really good sense to me. So, you know, you wrote it well. I was wondering if you could speak maybe to that subject a little bit and what your goal was with that and kind of how that ties into the work you're doing at uh, Whale Seeker. Because I think I find it quite interesting. I think others will too. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting, uh, yeah, it's an interesting topic. I, um, yeah. So I wrote, yeah. I, um, yeah. I think I, I think with that blog, I was trying to get at so like there's this kind of machine learning is an interesting one right because it's it's um it's like bad it's like really good like a lot of machine learning is like really good but bad in ways that humans that makes humans like distrust it i think that's kind of one of one of the big like challenges that machine learning or, or like ai has to has to overcome and um so like i don't know for example like i've been doing yeah i've been i've been doing some some machine learning um at work recently that like you know if you compare it with the human results they're not like like they're not they're actually they're not that different right like if you like um uh do any kind of numerical like test on on them um, on the, to, to measure like, you know, how different are the humans and the AI, AI's predictions, but they look weird. Like this, these are on images, right? They're like polygons and they look weird. They're like, they've got like jaggedy edges and they're kind of like, they do things that humans would never do. And so I think that's understandably for people that are, um, yeah, for, for people that are trying to think about, you know, the ways in which AI can, re can, uh, replace or supplement, um, hum or, or let's say augment human, human, uh, uh, labor. There's that kind of, oh, like, oh, that looks, that looks weird. You know, like, how can we trust this? And so there's kind of like the, the bar for how a accurate AI has to be, can, can be 
kind of artificially inflated to this point where sometimes it's even like beyond what we can expect from humans, like, right, like humans sometimes are inconsistent and messy. And, uh, you know, when they, let's say when they're like annotating data, the humans mess up all the time. So I guess there's an interesting, and I was just scratching the surface of that, but I think there's an interesting question there of like, what, what, what is a realistic expectation for, for AI? And like, how can we, um, cause at some point, right. We, we, we want to, to use AI if it's, it's, if it's delivering, you know, better results that we can quantify in some way. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Got it. I think, yeah, like, I mean, kind of being in this realm too is, uh, like, it's definitely an interesting time to be here because I think, you know, we're just sort of getting started with a lot of things and like a lot of kind of the explainability pieces or, um, like the observability pieces, a lot of companies right. are trying to put more focus into now. And so like even some, like some, you know, a good, a good point is it's often a good example to not use, say, the most complex models or the most complex algorithms, because say with that, we lack like an explainability piece down the line. Whereas if we use something that say like hits our business objective and like it can work on the business side, uh, but, you know, still give us uh, like explainability piece, then it's like, okay, we can kind of look at that. Um, so that sounds sure. good in regards to maybe like the, uh, kind of like learning technical skill, maybe, um, kind of as like a bit of a wrap up is, do you have kind of any advice, like from your side and your experiences that you'd want to share to maybe say students who are in school right now, or like young professionals on kind of like finding their purpose, like within either their, uh, education or kind of their work going forward? Um, yeah. So, sorry. So just advice for, for people who are trying to find. Kind of find like a bit of a why for like, maybe say like their direction in either school or like work going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I guess I feel like I was so, you know, so much, um, so much of what I like was fortunate, like so much of what caused the kind of like developments that I, I appreciate in my career were just like, um, so far we're just like, there was a lot of luck. Um, so there's that, there's that, but like, um, I think that what, what we were talking about, about like snow, that kind of snowball effect, right? Like, I think that's something to, to be aware of and, and, and just to like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like maybe just like kind of being, willing to like, or like taking time to like pursue things that you're interested in school, but like maybe don't like quite fit inside like the, the way you're learning it in class and like, oh, like what if I like, you know, see how that, um, you know, like pursue, you know, carry, uh, follow up on those things um, and kind of allow those interests, like nourish those interests, um, which is of course tough. Like I, I think like if you're really, like in a really packed, if you're like say an undergrad, like you're your schedule's packed, you have enough work to do, um, as it is. Uh, um, but, but I think, yeah, yeah. Just kind of like nurturing those. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think I've, I don't know if I, I feel like I have any, like, you know, you know, big, uh, pieces of advice though. Yeah. I, I just think your story in general is a really good example because yeah, it's hard to nurture those when you don't have a lot of time and have a packed schedule, but I think that's the best time to find it too. Cause then that's, if it's really worth it, you're going to make the time and find the time. Like when you were teaching, uh, that was a super busy time for you, but you got this opportunity like for whale seeker and you know, you, you found a way to make it work eventually. Right. So it's just like, if it's your thing, you're not going to let it go away kind of. So it's, um, it might almost be better to find those types of things when you're super busy, like an undergrad. And so like the advice you gave, I think it's probably important to, uh, uh, to try and nourish that when you when you find it and if it's not that important maybe you won't do it then if it is then then you will but i think it like it seems like you've been quite you know curious with with the things you want to pursue and i think that's an important trait uh as mm -hmm. well so no i think that's really good advice but um i think maybe that's where we will wrap up for today so I uh, just want to say thanks so much, Malcolm, for coming on. That's a super interesting story. We haven't had one like this yet. This is pretty crazy linguistics to working with whales, to coding and everything. Just I, I love how your journey is just all over the map here. It's super cool. So I'll be really excited to see where you end up. I think anything is on the table for the future. So I'll be watching intently for sure. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, thanks, Malcolm.
Okay, everyone, hope you enjoyed uh, Malcolm's episode. I know I sure did. That was a real fun conversation, hearing all his insights about the twists and turns his career has taken so far, and he's ended up in a really good spot uh, here in Montreal at the at the startup, doing what he loves. So it was great. Uh, he had a lot of good advice in there. Um, yeah, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Dave, what are your what are your final thoughts on the interview? Yeah, great, uh, great interview. Really enjoyed it. I think um, anybody you know who's thinking about maybe wants to study abroad or perhaps work at a startup or learn how to code, anything like that, will uh, have some insights from Malcolm's experience. So yeah, thanks a bunch to Malcolm for coming on. Really appreciate that. And um, as always, guys, thanks for supporting the podcast. You know, uh, if you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. And anybody else you want to see us uh, chat with in the future, would be happy to get on here. So um, enjoy the rest of your days and we will talk again soon. See you guys.